Dayton Leroy Rogers was born in 1953 in Moscow, Idaho. This guy was the epitome of evil, masquerading as your average Joe. At first glance, he might have seemed like a decent guy. A skilled mechanic and handyman by day, you'd never suspect that once the sun went down, he morphed into a different kind of handyman, one specialized in pain and torture. We're talking about a guy who manipulated people who used his charm to lure women into a false sense of security. But once he had them where he wanted, he tortured them. He used tools you'd find in any auto mechanic's toolbox to torture and mutilate his victims. Wrenches, screwdrivers, knives, each a tool of agony in Roger's sadistic workshop. And the worst part? He didn't stop at death. Post-mortem mutilation was his gruesome signature, a final act of desecration on the bodies of his victims. A human monster, pure and simple, lurking in the woods of Oregon's Malala Forest. Born into a family that seemed typical for its time, Dayton Leroy Rogers' youth didn't raise too many red flags, at least not publicly. His childhood home wasn't some house of horrors. However, he started showing his dark tendencies early on, getting his first criminal conviction at just 16. In and out of juvenile detention, he made a habit of theft and assaulting women, yet he ended up getting married three times. Behind those seemingly normal eyes lurked a twisted mind that harbored sadistic fantasies. It's as if a switch flipped inside him, one that blurred the lines between reality and his darkest urges. He didn't just fantasize about violence. He meticulously planned it out like a director preparing for a horror film. He consumed violent pornography, delving into books and forums that glorified sadistic behavior, molding his horrifying ideology. The more he fed this monster inside him, the more insatiable it became, driving him to commit acts so heinous they defy human comprehension. Dayton Leroy Rogers had a particular type. He preyed on vulnerable women, many of whom were involved in sex work or struggling with addiction. The tally of Dayton Leroy Rogers' victims is still not fully confirmed, but authorities linked him to the deaths of at least seven women. They were all found in the Malala Forest, but only after enduring agonizing final moments. Each victim was different, but they all had something in common. The sadistic manner in which they were treated before they're murdered. Rogers didn't just kill, he relished in the act. Strangling, stabbing, and mutilating were all part of his twisted ritual. He took keepsakes from his victims, like clumps of hair and jewelry. Some of his known victims include Jennifer Smith, a 25-year-old who was found mutilated, her body showing signs of severe torture. Maureen Ann Hodges, only 26, she was discovered with her hands tied and indications of being brutally beaten. Lisa Marie Mock. At just 23, she was found stabbed multiple times and horrifically disfigured. Imagine being abducted and finding yourself in a confined space, shrouded in darkness, except for the occasional flicker of a bare light bulb. Rogers would make his victims aware that escape was impossible. Ropes and restraints were often so elaborately rigged that any attempt to free oneself would lead to additional agony. Some were made to endure hours of physical and psychological torture. Rogers would sometimes talk to them, whispering disturbing promises of what he planned to do next, as if trying to shatter any remaining will to live. Others said they could hear the chilling sound of him sharpening his knives, building anticipation to unbearable levels before he even laid a finger on them. The atmosphere was perpetually thick with a sense of impending doom, punctuated by screams that would never be heard by anyone but Rogers himself. For some victims, their final moments were spent in a state of dissociation, a mental escape from a reality too horrific to comprehend. For others, their last gasps were choked out in cries for help, mercy, or even a quick end, knowing full well that none would come.
when investigators finally got a look into Roger's so-called torture chambers, they were confronted with a setup that could only be described as a sadist's playground. Tools of torment were meticulously organized. Everything from knives and hacksaws to electrical cords and other instruments designed to inflict maximum pain. Victims weren't just killed, they were subjected to ungodly amounts of torture. Rogers had a twisted modus operandi. He'd abduct women, often sex workers, or those with addiction issues who he presumed wouldn't be immediately missed. He'd tie them up, gag them, and then the real horror would begin. Reports suggest that Rogers enjoyed stabbing his victims multiple times, inflicting wounds that were painful but not immediately fatal. He'd revel in their pain, watching their eyes widen in agony and fear. It wasn't enough to simply kill, he had to dehumanize, humiliate, and absolutely destroy them both physically and mentally. In some instances, he mutilated the bodies of his victims post-mortem, removing their feet with a hacksaw. Sometimes, he would even revisit the forest where he dumped the bodies, presumably to relive the vile acts he had committed. The discovery of these chambers shook even the most hardened investigators. Among the tools were pliers used to extract fingernails and toenails, making each pull a calculated move in his twisted game. He had a collection of knives of varying sizes, each sharpened to a fine edge, capable of making both shallow cuts to prolong the pain or deep stabs for more immediate terror. There was also electrical cords. These were used for shocking his victims, pushing them to the brink of consciousness, yet keeping them alive for more torture. Rogers also displayed surgical precision in his methods. He would sometimes bind his victims in such a way that any struggle would tighten the knots, causing self-inflicted pain that only added to the horror of their situation. His mutilation methods varied from victim to victim, sometimes focusing on cutting away flesh in sensitive areas, other times going straight for the dismemberment. The discovery of these chambers shook even the most hardened investigators. Many of the women were prostitutes or drug addicts. Had these women been taken more seriously when they went missing, perhaps investigations would have accelerated. Sensationalism often trumps accountability. Missing persons reports and early suspicions didn't get the same media traction as they should have, again, because of the social standing of the victims. It's a deeply uncomfortable reality to confront, but ignoring it only perpetuates the conditions that allow such horror to happen in the first place. August 1987, Clackamas County cops finally catch a break. Rogers is arrested during a routine traffic stop. In his truck, they find evidence, tools, blood stains that leads them to suspect something far more sinister. But it's the finding of a body near Malala Forest that blows the case wide open. Prosecutors lay out a case meticulously built on forensic evidence, harrowing survivor testimonies, and a record of prior convictions that paints Rogers as a cold-blooded predator. Each piece of evidence is more damning than the last. Bone-chilling audio recordings, deeply disturbing photos, and the tools he used. Guilty on all counts. Dayton Leroy Rogers is sentenced to death. A sentence that is later changed to life imprisonment due to Oregon's shifting stance on the death penalty. He may be behind bars, but the shadows he's cast are long and dark. Survivors, family members, and investigators have to live with the nightmares he left behind. And for every Dayton Leroy Rogers behind bars, we're left to wonder how many more are out there.